You are listening to History Man, the platform for historians, authors, and museum directors to tell their stories of the American Revolution, walk in the footsteps of heroes, and proclaim freedom reigns. Recently, History Man was invited to the Dowtow Island Golf Community in Beaufort, South Carolina, as a guest of Charles Baxley. Charles is the chairman of the South Carolina American Revolution 250th Anniversary Commission and has carved out a phenomenal reputation as a Southern historian. His website, southerncampaigns.org, specializes in peer review articles and research from the Revolutionary War in the Southern states. He brings his meticulous talents as an attorney to the table as he walks us through the life of one of the most famous Revolutionary War heroes, Francis Marion. We are exceptionally proud to bring you stories and research from the Revolutionary War. The very nature of our mobile efforts to record these stories in different venues and environments often taxes our ability to offer consistent audio to our listeners. We are certain that this lecture will be worth the listen, despite some of our challenges. Here we have the first part of the two-part series on Francis Marion. Come walk in the footsteps of heroes and proclaim freedom reigns. Francis Marion is an interesting character. He's by far the most famous, um, he's by far the most famous South Carolinian in the American Revolution. And we'll talk a little bit about what Joe mentioned, and that is Walt Disney and what difference that made. But I can tell you this, if you want to be a Revolutionary War hero, you need a good publicist and maybe even a poet who can write an iambic pentameter, and that'll, that'll help a, a good bit. So please excuse me as I fumble through this stuff. Um, Francis Marion is a very interesting character, the real Francis Marion, not the legendary Francis Marion. And for the last 20 years, I've been working with a team of people to try to tease out what's real and what's legend. And sometimes they're so intertwined, you can't tell the difference. Now this is a little bit just about his, a, a thumbnail sketch of his life. 1732 means that by the time of the Revolution, he's an old man. He's already fought in the French and Indian War. He has a, a reputation as a military man. He is interested in politics enough to go to the South Carolina General Assembly, Provincial Assembly, and get himself elected as an officer in the second regiment of South Carolina troops in 1775. He is a planter by trade. He loves farming. And uh, his plantation was called Pond Bluff. And it's about three miles east of Utah Springs on the Santee River. About half of the plantation is now underwater and is private property. And there, there's nothing there of the revolutionary period to see even if you know you talked your way in there. Um, he, um, in the second South Carolina, was stationed at the Palmetto Log Revetment and Sand Fort on Sullivan's Island when the British decided to attack. And he was not in the artillery, he was not a fort defense man, he was in the infantry. But since the, um, there was a land attack, but they needed people to man the fort in case the fort was attacked, so his infantry regiment was stationed in the fort. Now, of course, it was mainly a naval bombardment, and to sustain the bombardment at night, you need to go out and patch the holes, and in the daytime, you need to help carry the powder and the shot to make sure that the cannons are fully armed. This, my friends, was a humiliating defeat for the Royal Navy and the British Army. The plan was pretty simple, not too much of a plan. They put an army of 3,500 men on shore on uh, what was called Long Island, then called Isle of Palms now. It was undeveloped. And it was probably the most miserable place on the earth you could be posted. There's no fresh water there, except there's enough to grow the giantest alligators and mosquitoes and spiders and everything, people, sand fleas, everything you didn't want. They ate the British Army's lunch. 
right across the inlet called Breach Inlet was the north tip of Sullivan's Island. There was a group of Americans stationed there to stop the British from crossing Breach Inlet, marching down south on Sullivan's Island and attacking the unfinished fort from the rear. The, the fort was maybe half finished when the British attacked. The Americans under Colonel William Thompson stopped the British Army at the Breach Inlet. Now the British Army was commanded by a guy named Sir Henry Clinton, and his number two was a guy named Lord Charles Cornwallis. And these names will come back to South Carolina a few years later to try to repair their damaged reputation. Now this is the setup, it's very simple, and I don't want to spend too much time on it. But in the 18th century, cannons were not mounted in gun turrets where you could have the ship be here and point any direction. If you want to change the way the cannons are pointed, you've got to change the way the ship is pointed. And so two of the six British warships got out and did the same thing I did in Charleston Harbor because you stand there at the battery and you look out over all this huge amount of water and you assume that it's all uh, 20 fathoms, fathoms deep well, most places it's 20 inches deep at high tide. <clears throat> and the Americans had taken down the navigation aids and the British ran two warships aground. Now if you're in the fort with a cannon and the British ship is stationary and it can't turn to fire back at you, you can tear it up and that's what happened. The cannoneers in the American fort tore, tore up two British capital warships at the south tip in Charleston Harbor where they ran on the ground. So if you take your skiff out there and you're saying, I can ride right straight over there, you're probably going to find either a mud bank or an oyster bed. And I can say that from first-hand experience. <laughs> so Marion was part of the heroes that saved the day on what we, are, we consider Carolina Day um, and celebrate every year now in Charleston. Um, he rose to command the second regiment from a captain of a company commander to command the second regiment. And he was in Charleston when the British came back under Sir Henry Clinton, but this time Clinton brought a different Navy commander, more ships, and 12,000 of his closest friends to take Charleston, and he did. Marion was not there. Marion had injured his foot. The um, commander of uh, Benjamin Lincoln of Charleston sent Marion home to recuperate. So when Charleston fell, Francis Marion was not captured, which is great for our team. Uh, he is a continental officer, strict disciplinarian. We have his order book, so we can read what was going on every day in his life when they're garrisoned here and there. They catch somebody stealing, playing cards, sleeping on guard duty, all those sins, what they did to them. And let me tell you, being under continental discipline would be what we would call today brutal. It was brutal. And Francis Marion was the chief officer in charge of administering that and approving all that discipline. So the question becomes, is how are you this straight up disciplinarian and you take yourself to be a guerrilla commander with no paid troops, um, with no government behind you, with no supply chain behind you, no money, no nothing, and you do what the Israelis did in Egypt, they had to make bricks without straw. And that they did. And that is the miracle of Francis Marion, the miracle. We're gonna talk about that tonight. After the war, he is um, appointed a, a brigadier general. And uh, I mean, during the war, he's appointed a brigadier general. And um, he is elected to the South Carolina Senate. He's a very popular guy. And uh, he marries a distant cousin, Mary Esther Vido. Um, they're both um, pretty old for the time. Um, no children were had. And um, he died at Pond Bluff um, in uh, 1795, his plantation. Now, 
How did Francis Marion get to be the swamp fox? So Francis Marion is thrown into this um, world of disorder. When Charleston falls, the uh, South Carolina government falls with it. And the British installed a government. And South Carolina was pretty organized. It had a militia structure, you know, with commanders at the top and sub-commanders and what have you. Um, the, the next thing that happens is that the George Washington sends an army of relief from Morristown, New Jersey to walk to head of hell, ride boats to Petersburg, get off the boats and walk to South Carolina. And those brave Continental soldiers did that. And the Maryland line and the Delaware Delaware line, they picked up uh, soldiers from Virginia and militia from North Carolina and it came south. They were defeated at the Battle of Camden on August the 16th. That is like all the Continental soldiers in the south that are going with that. The relief army, the regular army that surrendered at Charleston, and the relief army. And the only person who had put any organization at all to the old militia was Thomas Sumter. And he did it voluntarily, he did it without any command, he, he was not even a Continental officer at the time. People just knew who he was, he had been a Continental officer. These uh, militia colonels flocked to him and they formed a militia in the up central part of South Carolina. <clears throat> Marion was assigned by Horatio Gates the day before the Battle of Camden to go to King Street, South Carolina and take command of the King Street area, the Williamsburg, South Carolina area of militia. The commander of that militia had been in Charleston and had been released on parole saying he couldn't fight anymore and he was honoring his parole. So they wrote to Gates and said, send us a proper Continental Army so the officers, so they got Marion. Marion set about organizing that militia. A few fortunate things happened that made that work. Marion learned through his intelligence network that the British were moving the Continental prisoners captured in Camden to Charleston to put in jail. And they were doing it in groups of 150 Continental soldiers. And they were moving down the King's Highway from Camden down to what is called Nelson's Ferry, across the ferry and then down through Monk's Corner into Charleston. Of course, we know with 2020 hindsight what was going to happen to them. The officers would be separated and kept in old barracks in um, Mount Pleasant. Most of the soldiers were put in old, non-seaworthy hulks of boats and chained up out in the harbor and basically left to rot out there in the harbor. So Marion said to the militiamen from King Street, let's go rescue these guys. So they figured out that they were going to go to Thomas Sumter's house on the north end of Nelson's Ferry. And on that map on the lake, the blue water is Lake Marion. The red circle is about where Thomas Sumter's house was. And so they snuck up on the guards of those 150 Maryland prisoners and captured the guards and freed 150 Maryland prisoners at very little cost to the local militia. Of course, that made him a hero amongst the local militia, and that starts what I call the legend of the Swamp Fox. So they call him the Swamp Fox, but they knew this guy was the real thing who could come up with that intelligence and that plan and pull it off and recapture 150 uh, very valuable and hard to replace men. Thereafter, what Marion did was he started going to the militia colonels that were in command of the various militia units up and down the PD River. So the myth is, is that Marion raises his flag and says, I'm happy Francis Marion, and a thousand people flock to him and say, I want to be in your army. That is not what happened. He convinced these, this group of leaders to get together in a loose association and continue the fight against the British. And so he talked people like George Hicks, Jacob Baxter, Lemuel Benton, Hugh Giles, John James, uh, et cetera, into forming a loose alliance. Those men had been in an alliance before. They were all part of the militia brigade commanded by a fellow who had died in the PD River area. 
And they were saying, well, you know, it's all over. The governors go, the British have got us all captured. We don't have any hope. So what Marion had was the power of selling hope and the power of a great big idea. That's all he had. He didn't have any bullets, he didn't have any gunpowder, he didn't have any uniforms, he didn't have any horses, he didn't have any bayonets, he had nothing like that. Not a penny to his name. But he talked those five militia units into joining force and staying the course with the, um, with the militia fighting the British. So um, Marion forms a camp at a place called Ports Ferry on the PD River. And Ports Ferry is pretty much out in the middle of nowhere, but it is close to a, a place called Snow's Island that has, will become famous in the future. And he finds out that 60, uh, I mean about 150 loyalists are gathered at a place called Blue Savannah with the intent of coming and getting married. Marion had 60 men. So he did what George Patton would have done, he did what a lot of military heroes would have done. Instead of running, he said, we're going to attack. We've got the element of surprise. Nobody will think that we're going to attack. So Mary takes his 60 mounted militiamen and rides about um, 30 miles north to a place called Blue Savannah and routes the loyalists that are there. Now, most of his men didn't have swords because they really were just farmers. They might have had a knife, a kitchen knife, they may have had an axe. They, they had anything they could pick up a pitchfork, you know, that would do some damage. And Marion absolutely supplied, su surprised Ganey's um, militia at a place called Blue Savannah. Now, I have read for 10 or 15 years a place called Blue Savannah. But Blue Savannah doesn't sound like any kind of Carolina place name. And I couldn't figure out what on earth Blue Savannah was. So a lady who was doing genealogical research cracked the code. You see on that aerial photograph, there are three elliptical shaped ovals in the trees. Those are called Carolina Bays. And there are thousands of them in North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, down into Florida. And they are Sometimes they're full of water. Lake Waccamaw, North Carolina is a big Carolina Bay full of water. And a lot of them now have been drained because if you can drain a form of Carolina Bay and plow it, it's the best fertilized soil there is because it used to be in a swamp. And those Carolina Bays, a lot of them have names. If, a, if the lightning strikes the trees during a dry period of time, all the trees in the bay can burn down. And then you're left with the grasses that grow up in that rich, moist soil in the place of the trees. So we found out that Blue Savannah was called Blue Savannah because if you went through the savannah with your wagon, the mud was so black that it was dark blue looking. And so it's blue mud in the savannah. Now, if you look at that aerial photograph, that's an infrared one. You can see the black soil next to where it says blue savannah, the elliptical shape. That is the blue savannah where the game was camped. We know this now because archaeology has proved it. A lady figured it out and then told us, is the feedback bad? Because I don't, I don't want y'all to be driven crazy. So, about the feedback, you can be driven crazy by me, I don't mind that. But. So, Blue Savannah was a Marian victory. Cornwallis was furious at the Americans. If you look at the Patriot, Cornwallis looks like this person who never gets flat, who never loses his temper. But if you read his instructions to his officers, Oh yeah, he got mad. He got mad at several things. Number one, the British put 100 sick soldiers on rafts at Sherall to raft them down the Petey River to a hospital at Georgetown. The Americans found out about it and interdicted that flotilla. The guards that were sent to guard it were loyalists. 
and they all took off. They didn't want to fool with the South Carolina militia. Number two, a whole regiment of Thomas Sumter's men went to Cornwallis and said, we want to sign up a British program, you know, give us, you know, your gold balloon, equip us, and we'll be, you know, your unit. So Cornwallis signed them all up. He had his men sign them up. They equipped them all. These men rode right out of Cornwallis's camp, straight to Thomas Sumter's camp, with all this new horse furniture, guns, bayonets, bullets, all this stuff, and all these shiny coins that the British had given them. Well, you don't think that makes Cornwallis mad. The next thing <coughs> is to get after loyalists at Blue Savannah and just scatter them to the wind where they're no longer a force. Now, in the grand scheme of things, that would not have mattered too much. But what Cornwallis did is he ordered a raid to go to King's Tree and then go down low on the Peavey River and go up both sides of the Peavey River and find anybody who took parole and who fought against the British after taking parole and hang them. And then Cornwallis says in his letter, if it's too many people where you don't have time to hang them all, just pick the worst ones out you want and just hang them. This is summary execution by a major in the British Army. So when writers historically have been looking for bad guys, Carlton is you know, the first choice. The second choice is a guy named James Wings. He, he um, commanded this raid. When he got back, <clears throat> it turned out only one person had been hung, and that person was evidently a defector from the Royal Navy. And Wings didn't want to do that because he's in the Army, and he can't mess with Navy people. So he gave them to the Royalists, and the Royalists decided to hang Vince Adam Cusack. And he was hung near Society Hill, South Carolina. What had happened when Marion found out about this huge raid? Since Barfield's Loyalists were gone, he and his men could escape to North Carolina, where they had refuge, because the Americans still controlled North Carolina, or the British controlled South Carolina. So he was able to escape the, this group that was out to get him. They, I mean, he had a big red X on his back. Cornwallis wasn't too happy when Weems came back and said he didn't hang anybody, and he let Marion get away.